Next, I'd like to launch into some cases to uh, demonstrate how these symptoms may present in real patients. This is an 80-year-old gentleman I followed a number of years back, and he presented uh, to me, and he said, I've been told I've had Alzheimer's by my primary care doctor, but my wife thinks I'm depressed. And he's had about a year of cognitive changes, um, but also accompanied by a 20-pound weight loss, loss of interest, feeling life isn't worth living anymore, withdrawing from activities, um, a lower appetite. With a cognitive screen, his mini mental state exam was a 19 of 30. But also he met criteria for major depression and the time frame of his cognitive change tracked right with the depressive symptoms. Laboratory workup showed no reversible causes of dementia there was nothing significant found on neuroimaging, and we embarked on treatment with an SSRI antidepressant. His symptoms got better, as did his memory. He came back a few months later and showed me his holiday card. Here's what he wrote on it. Dear friends, I've been cured of Alzheimer's. My mini mental score has improved from a 19 to 30 and he did well for two years. However, uh, two years later, we began to see the emergence of progressive cognitive issues, and these were unrelated to mood symptoms. We did try to increase his antidepressant. It made no um, impact on his cognitive symptoms. And um, then with his memory deficits, we saw the emergence of anxiety, not generalized anxiety, but memory-based anxiety. He couldn't remember where his wife was going, therefore he worried about his safety and repeatedly called if she left the house. Two teaching points from this. Depression can have a reversible cognitive impairment, and treating depression can improve this. Second teaching point is that oftentimes the first um, episode of depression occurring in late life is a prodrome uh, to uh, impending uh, neurodegenerative illness. And so we always have to have a high suspicion when someone like this gentleman rebounds. Uh, we know that 5% a year of people will progress to a neuro neurodegenerative illness, so we do need to continue screening these folks. As we talk about depression, anxiety, and our other psychiatric symptoms, uh, this slide just highlights that there's neurocircuits. So it's not only where uh, we see neurodegeneration occurring, but it's also the neurodegeneration affects the neurocircuitry, leading to these behaviors that we see here. Also, Anxiety and depression are on a spectrum, and we have overlap symptoms. Sleep concentration, energy, and irritability are common to both depression, MDD, and generalized anxiety. However, anxiety alone does not have the sadness, the hopelessness, appetite changes, or wishing to die. And generalized anxiety has multiple worries, some muscle tension, and restlessness. So just keep in mind that oftentimes these overlap, and there should be a third circle as well because the cognitive symptoms also can overlap with these as well. Here's another case that one of our fellows in clinic had treated. Uh, this is a uh, person, a 51-year-old uh, female full professor who was referred to uh, the Women's Mental Health Clinic because she had new onset bipolar disorder at menopause. Uh, for about one to two years, she'd been very distractible at work. And if we look at this, I've listed these in that dig fast mnemonic order. She was very distractible. She wasn't putting in grants anymore, and she had poor work performance. She had indiscretion, uh, some inappropriate contacts with students that um, got the attention of her dean. She was buying things she really didn't need. She didn't need to go to the dollar store and buy things. And then on a few occasions, 
It was found that she did some shoplifting as well. She was much more gregarious than usual, but if she was ever um, confronted with this change of behavior, she became very irritable. She was grandiose. She bragged about her fame, her ideas, and how she was prominent internationally. She was very prominent, but not on an international scale. She had racing thoughts. She was very busy thinking about things. She always paced. Her sleep was disrupted, and her husband reported that there'd be food all over the counters, and she was raiding the refrigerator at night. You couldn't interrupt her talking, and she got mad if you tried to, and she would not reciprocate in conversation. Her husband also mentioned that she seemed uh, indifferent to some of the college-age children's problems. She just didn't care and talked about herself. And during our exam, she was very inappropriately familiar. She was ex uh, touching the examiner's face and stroking her hair and making comments about that. Something didn't quite seem right, uh, and a cognitive disorder was suspected. Oftentimes they aren't in general psychiatry clinics, but thinking about a person that's had no previous psychiatric history, we screened if there was any postpartum mood disorder, there was not. There was no family history of mood disorders. Uh, laboratory results um, did not demonstrate anything. We did some functional imaging that did show some uh, uh, frontal and temporal uh, hypometabolism. She did have some frontal release signs on neurologic exam. So frontal temporal dementia oftentimes will present with psychiatric symptoms. The 2011 criteria for the behavioral variant of FTD um, recommends having three of these six symptoms. Uh, disinhibition, and she certainly had that. Uh, other patients will have co the complete opposite, apathy and inertia. A loss of sympathy or empathy can be noted. Perseverative or compulsive behaviors, and we could see that with her um, compulsive shopping and shoplifting. Hyperorality. Uh, raiding the refrigerator at night, and a an, uh, disexecutive functioning uh, that she couldn't maintain her normal work activities. Uh, especially with the disinhibited type, these folks are often thought to uh, be bipolar with a manic episode. Frontotemporal dementia also has a language variant that we won't discuss in our talk here today. Now moving on to Jackie. Jackie is another one of my favorite patients. She was a 70-year-old uh, widowed woman. Uh, she was very active in her church, went to church daily, and also uh, helped to run the canteen at the Red Cross blood drives around Southeast Michigan. And she was referred by her primary care doctor. Uh, the concern was, uh, is that she has been calling the police and calling her daughter frequently, and she's already had the locks changed twice and is uh, still calling the locksmith. And what she says is that they are coming into my house when I'm gone and stealing my papers. Upon exam, she had no depressive symptoms whatsoever, no past psychiatric history of depression, no active medical problems, um, no laboratory or radiologic abnormalities. Cognitive screening, um, this was in the day when many mental state exams were our standard. Her exam was 30 of 30 on the Folstein. The only abnormality of something different was her clock. I had her draw a clock with a hands at 245, and her clock had three hands, one at the two, one at the four, and one at the five. Formal neuropsychometric testing um, also did not show any patterns of deficit, um, but I was highly suspicious uh, that there was a cognitive disorder. Psychosis seen in dementias, especially Alzheimer's disease, um, is, very, is quite common. When we see psych any type of late onset psychosis, the differential is quite wide. It includes dementia um, of all types, delirium, uh, 
we know that people with uh, pre-existing cognitive disorders are very sensitive to medical illnesses like urinary tract, also called bladder infections. Uh, some of these folks will um, only have hallucinations when they have an active infection and it clears up and goes away. Psychotic mood disorders, uh, both unipolar and bipolar uh, mood disorders can have psychotic components to them. And every once in a while, we'll see someone with a chronic psychotic disorder like schizophrenia that's just been kind of maintained and supported by the family that's never uh, has uh, come to the attention of treatment. However, in rank order, um, as far as differential diagnosis goes, um, usually for me it's dementia till proven otherwise. Schizophrenia is very uncommon after of age 40 and less than 5% at age greater than 60. And in 20 years of practice, I do not believe I've seen a late onset schizophrenia. So psychosis is usually dementia till proven otherwise. Uh, delusions are the most common type of symptom we see in Alzheimer's disease. And if we think about the content of these uh, delusions, oftentimes they're based in memory and cognitive deficits. Uh, like Jackie, there's the theft delusion. If we misplace our wallet, keys, or glasses, or papers, it does make sense that maybe someone came in and took them. If we aren't recognizing our home, then we believe our house is not our home. If we can't remember who's alive and who has passed away and have, uh, have lost our ability to kind of remember and process time and chronology, I may think that my mother's waiting for me, my father visited me, my deceased spouse will be coming home soon, or that I have to go to work. If we don't recognize or remember what we look like in later life, that person in the mirror may be a stranger. It can be Capgrass syndrome, where we don't remember what our loved one looks like, therefore, they seem like they're replaced by an imposter, or we just don't recognize our family in general, which is very frightening. This is another one of my favorite patients, and she came to me uh, with the chief complaint of being upset that the children would leave when she went to go get them tea and cookies. And uh, she was a delightful woman, a retired school teacher, who again had really no medical problems, some mild hypertension that had been well controlled for many years, um, on very few medications. And over the past year, um, intermittently, uh, maybe two to three times a week, children would come visit in her living room. They might sit in a circle and um, play with sticks or bounce a ball. Uh, sometimes they might sit on her couch. They would look at her. They wouldn't talk with her, uh, but she could see they were enjoying themselves. She would talk back. She really enjoyed their presence, you know, because she was a teacher. She loves kids. And she'd say, um, you wait here, and I'll get you some cake and tea. And when she'd come back, they'd be gone. And this was getting upsetting to her. She'd call her daughter. And the daughter didn't know what to make of this either. Again, her um, laboratory workup, uh, radiology workup were all negative. Medication review did not show anything that would account for this. Um, and uh, cognitive screening as well as formal neuropsychometric testing showed no deficits. However, though, over the past year, we began to see the symptoms of dementia with Lewy bodies. And uh, dementia with Lewy bodies is a, um, often has these complex, silent, visual hallucinations very early on in the disease course. Also, dementia with Lewy body is delirium-like, where people will have days where they are crystal clear. They won't have any hallucinations. They won't have any cognitive problems. And there can be a marked contrast with their bad days where they're very cloudy and look very confused. 
If you do some cognitive screening, you ask them, is this a good day or a bad day? And there can be a five-point difference uh, fluctuation on the cognitive screen. Also, uh, dementia with Lewy body patients are very sensitive to almost all medicines, especially psychoactive medicines, and especially the antipsychotic class of medicine. And rigidity falls and Parkinsonian features also emerge. For uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, um, two of these three symptoms are required as core symptoms. Visual hallucinations, fluctuating cognition, and Parkinsonism. And as you see, two of these three core symptoms are psychiatric. Supportive suggestive symptoms include uh, sensitivity to these antipsychotic medications, REM behavior disorders, personality and mood changes, such as anxiety and depression, apathy, uh, delusions, other types of hallucinations, autonomic dysfunction, uh, such as blood pressure drops leading to falls and syncope, and transient loss of consciousness. Again, Lewy body illness has many of these behavioral and psychiatric features um, as its core symptoms. In my clinical experience with patients, these are things they describe. Uh, very commonly, looking out in the garage or in a car, they'll see the cars jammed full of people. They'll watch uh, construction equipment out in their yard um, prepare a construction site. They may see spiders or rats or snakes that are very frightening. And a uh, few people have had very distressing hallucinations um, such as um, dismembered bodies with chainsaw cuts on them that have been very, very distressing. Um, I couldn't find a picture to represent this, but a few patients have also had uh, tactile sensations in their mouths, um, such as wires, uh, razors, uh, shards of glass embedded in their gums. That also is very distressing to them. Uh, so again, psychiatric symptoms, hallucinations, um, all types, uh, in dementias, so, uh, the auditory, especially in the um, dementia with Lewy bodies, are present usually with the visual hallucinations, and Alzheimer's sometimes will see them by themselves. Also in the Lewy body spectrum of dementias, that includes Parkinson's, very common to have presence hallucinations, feeling like someone's in the room, though you can't quite see them, or passage, which are these uh, vague, shadowy figures that just kind of flip by in the corners of your vision. Delusions, we've also talked about those. The types of delusions, we also touched on the misidentification, which is very painful for the caregivers, especially when the uh, caregiver that's providing the bulk of the support is accused of being an imposter. I won't take food from you. You're not the real Amy. Also the Fregoli syndrome, uh, where one person is putting on disguises and pretending to be many other people. A condition called reduplicative paraamnesia that either um, people or a place exist in two, place, uh, two, parts, uh, two spaces in time. People can also uh, experience that there's a phantom border. I can never see them, but I know they live in the house. That someone that's uh, been out of the house for many years stops by to visit or that a deceased family member uh, is still alive. When we see a patient, we want to get a history from the patients and their families. If there's any type of cognitive disorder um, occurring, we need to know how things have changed, what functional status has changed, and the time course that that change has occurred over. We provide cognitive screening and refer to neuropsych testing if needed. We always um, do medical, neurologic, lab, and radiologic exams and provide a uh, medication review also looking at um, over-the-counter medications um, as well as substances. The symptom onset uh, is very important, knowing when the psychiatric symptoms and cognitive symptoms began. 
in making our diagnosis. If something has only changed over days to weeks, it's a delirium till proven otherwise. If something has happened over weeks to months, but everyone can agree that someone was attending church, going to the movies and paying their bills, and three months ago that changed, unless there is a vascular event, it's usually depression. And then if it's an insidious onset over months or years, and oftentimes family members will argue over when did things really change, we think of a neurodegenerative dementia uh, such as Alzheimer's. There are no FDA approved medicines for these behavioral and psychiatric symptoms. We always want to look at um, the environment, the caregiver, and make these changes first. However, we will want to use medications if we detect a major depression with or without suicidal thoughts. If the psychosis is causing a risk of harm, we don't have to treat happy hallucinations. Or the aggression is causing risk of harm to the person. If they're swinging at someone and could fall, if the swinging at someone could hurt someone, or if they could lose a placement. As uh, researchers have looked more closely at these psychiatric symptoms, symptom clusters have emerged that help us guide the treatment um, that we may prescribe. There's an apathetic cluster. People will uh, appear lazy. This is their caregiver's main complaint. I know they physically can do it, but they're just lazy. They're withdrawn, they have no interest, and they're amotivated. There's an aggressive cluster where people may resist their self-care. They don't want to get dressed. They don't want to get bathed. They might be physically or verbally aggressive. Agitation ends up being a, a catch-all, and we really need to specify what the behaviors are uh, so we know how to target them. It might be pacing. It might be shadowing or trailing someone. It might just be restlessness. It might be repetitive actions. It might be repetitive verbalization. It might be dressing or undressing, or maybe it's sleep problems. There's a psychotic cluster of symptoms, the ones that we focused on a lot today, hallucinations, delusions, and misidentification. And then the depression or depression anxious cluster, uh, sadness, anxiety, tearful, hopeless, feeling guilty. As I said, we always want to go with low-tech interventions first. We know that patients with sensory impairments, if they aren't getting uh, good information in, the processing gets confused and um, they have more behavioral disturbances and distress. So we want to correct for vision and hearing. Also, because of the nature of dementia, patients cannot express what's going on. They may not be able to put into words that they're having physical problems, that they're having reflux, upset stomach, that their bowels aren't working, that they're constipated, um, that their joints ache. So again, empirical trials of over-the-counter medicines uh, can be very helpful. Also, especially with the uh, cognitive changes that affect language and understanding, our words are not as effective and people may not be able to process and act on what we say. And it's important to think of, in communication, only 7% of what we hear are the actual words themselves and less in people with dementia. What we hear uh, more often is the body language and tone of voice. And caregivers can get very frustrated. They have one of the hardest jobs ever. They're on call 24 hours a day. They don't have uh, they're always on page, they're always on call, they don't have duty hour restrictions. So they get frustrated and what they say is a little bit of it, but their tone of voice and body language can really escalate these behaviors. So a lot of partner care coaching in communication strategies is vital. Helen Kales and our uh, University of Michigan Program for Positive Aging uh, is very interested in coming up with standardized uh, ways to improve uh, the care for behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia. Um, 
using a evidence-based approach, uh, which is now termed the DICE approach. The DICE approach is being um, adopted nationally and internationally as the algorithm uh, for uh, addressing behavioral disturbances. We don't want to just write a medication when medications don't work. Also, we don't want to write a medication for the wrong reason. If someone's having psychosis due to a bladder infection, we don't want to give an antipsychotic medication. The a DICE approach uh, is, stands for describe the problematic behavior, investigate the possible causes, create and collaborate a treatment plan, and then evaluate, was it successful, was it not, and then uh, circle back again. So to manage these behavioral symptoms, we always want to use approaches like DICE. If the type of dementia uh, may respond to a cholinesterase inhibitor, we want to have that on board first because cholinesterase inhibitors may improve these behavioral and psychiatric symptoms, especially in the Lewy body spectrum of illnesses. And then we go to medicines if the non-drug interventions fail. When we do use medications, we profile the behavioral disturbance, thinking about those uh, balloons of symptom clusters. For the depressed anxious, uh, anxious cluster, we will start with an antidepressant. If we have manic disinhibited behaviors, we'll go to a mood stabilizer. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, antipsychotic medicines. Uh, but they work best for the psychotic cluster. And uh, we always want to try to avoid benzodiazepines, though they're the ones that are requested most of us. There have been no studies to show that they work at all, and they do have significant um, morbidity associated with them and can paradoxically uh, cause disinhibition. The antipsychotic medicines have risks associated with them. Long-term risks are the metabolic syndrome, weight gain, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. There is a black box warning, a 1.6 uh, times increased risk of death, class effect, greater for the old-fashioned or typical antipsychotics like haloperidol than some of the newer ones. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is rare, but it can occur. And we know that patients with these, um, these compromised brains due to neurodegeneration are more sensitive to the EPS, the extrapyramidal or Parkinsonian side effects, where people can become very rigid um, with these medications. Clozapine is the agent with the least extrapyramidal side effects. Haloperidol has the greatest. Usually, we end up uh, using quetiapine if we do need to use this. And again, we don't have to treat happy hallucinations. Um, Antipsychotics are still uh, the drug of choice if there's dangerous aggressive behavior, and we always want to try a dose reduction after six months. A new medication has uh, been released in the past year called Pima Vanserin. It's an anti, it has antipsychotic action without the dopamine blockade, uh, working instead as on the serotonin system as a 5-HT2A inverse agonist. We don't, therefore, see the motor symptoms or the Parkinsonian symptoms as a result of this medication. Its indication is Parkinson disease uh, dementia, um, currently as its only FDA-indicated use, um, but it may show promise in some of our other uh, dementias as well. Uh, as we approach the end of our discussion, uh, this table shows that many psychiatric symptoms are present in our spectrum of dementias. Sometimes, uh, especially anxiety and depression can be prodromal symptoms, but are seen throughout the dementias. Apathy is also another very common symptom and distinct from depression. Disinhibition, we think of especially early in frontotemporal dementia. Delusions can be seen throughout. Visual hallucination, more in the dementias related to Lewy body illnesses. Uh, and we'll also see other uh, types of uh, sensory hallucinations, but not as common. So in summary, behavioral symptoms of dementia are very common. Almost all patients at some point in their dementia will experience them. 
These symptoms decrease the quality of life and increase the cost of care. And when we think of um, where the neurodegeneration and disruption of neurocircuitry is occurring because of neurodegeneration, these behaviors are predictable and expected. And that can be very reassuring to caregivers uh, to understand that there is a real medical cause for these symptoms that we're seeing. We always want to go with caregiver education and modify the environment first. We have no FDA approved medications for these behaviors, uh, but in uh, certain conditions, medications can be helpful. And again, since neurodegeneration progresses, the symptoms are a moving target, so we do try medication dose reductions. Uh, here are my references, and thank you so much for your attention today.